Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture 24 and in this segment we're going to talk a little bit more about the idea of turbulence and take a look at some of the mathematics behind that. So in the previous segment which, when we introduced the atmospheric boundulator we talked a little bit about turbulence but here I'm going to go ahead and uh, sort of dive deeper into that idea and also take a look at how exactly that, uh, how exactly turbulence is quantified in the atmosphere. So let's go ahead and dive right into that. So uh, maybe a uh, so let's actually go ahead and sort of introduce a more colloquial or layman's definition of turbulence. So usually when you think of turbulent motions, you're just referring to, you're just basically saying that the fluid is, the fluid's flow is rough or the airflow is rough. That's usually how we would characterize turbulence and the opposite of that would be a laminar flow pattern in which the flow pattern is really smooth. So layman's definition of turbulence would be just a rough flow pattern and a uh, the opposite of that would be a laminar flow pattern, which is a really, really smooth flow pattern. But since we are meteorologists, we like to think of things in a little bit more sophisticated terminology. So uh, one, uh, one uh, such definition is the variability of the mean wind or the variability of the wind pattern itself. So let's actually take a look at some of the mathematics behind this. And this is going to go back to, uh, I believe it was lecture 17, uh, the lecture on climate where we introduced this definition of the anomaly where the anomaly of an observed variable in the atmosphere is equal to the, obs the observed value minus the mean state. And in the case of climatology or in the case of uh, looking at climatology or the climate itself, the anomaly is equal to the observed value that we get minus the climatology which is the mean that we obtain over several decades of data. Now in the uh, in the boundary layer where you have these turbulent motions, you may remember back, remember back from lecture 13, our lecture on scales of motion, these turbulent motions in the atmosphere have very short time scales, They're usually on the order of uh, seconds, uh, maybe even a minute or two if you have a really turbulent flow pattern. So this mean that you get right here is not going to be going back several decades, it's going to be going back more like uh, maybe a few minutes, maybe an hour at the longest, maybe even a few seconds, just depends on what scale you're looking at. Looking at larger scale turbulence, they're going to be using a mean over a much larger time. Smaller scale turbulence will be using a mean over a much smaller time. But this uh, this allows us to sort of get an idea of how much turbulence is present in the atmosphere using this formulation, believe it or not. And the reason why is because if you've got a lot of turbulent motions in the atmosphere, then your deviations from the mean are going to be much larger. And that's sort of consistent because if the flow pattern is really rough, rough, that means that the flow pattern, the speed of the flow pattern is going to be varying pretty wildly. I want to it might be really strong, then it might be weak, then it might be really strong again. So the flow patterns, the speed of the flow pattern is going to be alternating very wildly. And that's going to give you much larger values of U prime. And a lot of times that's actually represented as the standard deviation. So one way to assess how much turbulence in the atmosphere is to calculate the standard deviation of the wind speed itself. But uh, one way of also looking at it is just seeing what sort of values of U prime we're obtaining. And sort of an extension of that, this is something that you'll get in, get more in depth into in some of your later dynamics courses, but we can also take this mathematical definition of anomaly and rewrite it a little bit. So here we're going to solve for the observation U. And we can write the observed values in the atmosphere as a mean state which is also sometimes referred to as a background state, plus the deviation from the mean state. So that's just simply doing some algebra on this equation here to rewrite this equation in terms of the mean state and the deviation from the mean state. Because if you think about it in the atmosphere, uh, the weather patterns are more or less just a deviation from the mean state. So if you think about, say, surface pressure, usually your surface pressure uh, is going to be around 1,013 millibars. So if you've got a say 1,009 millibars, that means you've got a minus 4 millibar deviation, which means you've got low pressure and maybe some unsettled weather patterns. But usually you need pressures much lower than that before you get much in the way of unsettled weather. So the main takeaway message there is that weather can be sort of uh, represented as some sort of deviation from a mean state or some sort of deviation from a background state. And again, you'll talk more about these formulations in some of your later dynamics courses. But the main thing that I want to highlight is how if you have really large values of U prime, that means that sort of implies that you've got uh, more turbulence in the atmosphere. Um, and this sometimes is also referred to as an unstable flow pattern. And again, lower values of U prime, meaning your observed values of the wind are really close to the mean. So if the wind is not varying very much, then it's not going to be, the deviations for the mean are going to be really small. And this would then tend to imply that you've got a laminar or a stable flow pattern.
And while we're on the subject of turbulence, let's actually go ahead and talk about some of the sources of turbulence in the atmosphere. So one of which, which you kind of already alluded to in the previous segment when we talked about the boundary layer, was the rising columns of air that occur. So when we talked about the boundary layer during the daytime, if you got really strong heating, then your air near ground level is going to be heating up, which is going to result in some buoyant motion. So the air is going to want to rise. That produces rising thermals. And those can be a source of turbulent motions in the atmosphere, especially if those thermals are rising very rapidly. Another thing that can produce turbulence is the presence of friction, which tends to result in some sort of wind shear in the atmosphere. And we'll actually take a look at an illustration to sort of visualize how exactly this occurs. But again, the boundary layer is a region of really strong friction. And it turns out that if you have really strong friction present at some layer in the atmosphere, then, excuse me, if you've got really strong friction present in the atmosphere, that tends to result in stronger shearing motions. And those shearing motions will produce uh, some degree of turbulence in the, in the atmosphere. Excuse me, Ken. And that's usually going to occur in the boundary layer. And another thing that can produce turbulence, and we'll also see an illustration of this, but it won't be in this segment. It'll be towards the end when we talk about some urban flow patterns. But it also turns out that if you've got some sort of object uh, present in the boundary layer or just present somewhere, that can also be a source of turbulence in the atmosphere. In fact, one of the, uh, one of the larger hazards for aircraft is the turbulent motions that are caused by an airplane moving through the atmosphere. And this is one of the reasons why airplanes are not supposed to fly in really tight formations because those turbulent motions can uh, cause problems for airplanes that are flying too close to each other. So it's not necessarily just a, an object on ground level, but this also is a consequence that occurs in uh, other levels in the atmosphere. But usually uh, this is a process that's most pronounced at ground level for tall stationary objects like maybe tall buildings, hillsides, and even forested areas, these can also produce turbulent motions if the background flow pattern is sufficiently strong. And we'll take a look at a visual representation of that and towards the end of this lecture. And a physical parameter that's often used to quantify turbulence is the Reynolds number, which is defined as the characteristic horizontal wind times the characteristic length scale, capital L, and all that is divided by Greek letter nu, and Greek letter nu represents the kinematic viscosity of the flow pattern. And a typical value for this at around zero degrees Celsius is 1.46 times 10 to the minus fifth meter squared per second. Uh, those might seem like really odd units, but Reynolds number is defined to be a dimensionless parameter, meaning it doesn't have any units or of any kind. So in order for this equation to be dimensionally consistent, since my numerator has a velocity times a length, which gives me meters squared per second, say for an example of uh, just using standard MKS units, says I have meters squared per second in the numerator. In order for this to be dimensionless, then my denominator also has to be in units of meters squared per second. So that's where these weird units come from. And low values of Reynolds number, say under 1,000, uh, suggest that you've got a relatively laminar flow pattern. And this sort of makes sense, right? Because if you've got, uh, in it, usually if you've got a relatively weak pattern to begin with, then your flow pattern has a better chance of being laminar. And lower value of U would tend to result in a, a lower value of Reynolds number, which would tend to imply more of a laminar flow pattern. Contrast that with high values of Reynolds number, say over 10,000, that would tend to suggest that you've got mostly a turbulent flow pattern. And you might be looking at these numbers thinking, okay, well, what happens between 1,000 and 10,000? Um, that's more of a gray area. So right between those different values of Reynolds number, between 1,000 and 10,000, you might have a mix of laminar and turbulent flow patterns, or it might be an intermittent uh, pattern. It might be laminar for a few seconds and then turbulent for some length of time, then laminar, then turbulent, or you might just have laminar and turbulent patterns sort of coexisting. So in between 1,000 and 10,000, you can uh, have a conditions that favor both laminar and turbulent flow patterns. But usually under 1,000, when Reynolds number is under 1,000, that's predominantly a laminar flow pattern. And a value over 10,000 would be primarily a turbulent flow pattern. And here, let's go ahead and sort of illustrate how exactly friction uh, it produces turbulent motions in the atmosphere. So let's say that I have roughly the same wind speed. If we want to assign this a number, we can say the wind is blowing horizontally at 10 meters per second, just a nice even round number. And uh, you may remember back from lecture seven, when we took a look at some various friction parameters, one of which was the shear stress parameter. Uh, 
uh, one of the dependencies on shear stress parameter was density. And if you've got a higher density, then you're going to have a higher shear stress parameter, which means your force of friction is going to be stronger. And if you've got a lower value of density, then you're going to have weaker friction. And that makes intuitive sense. If you have a fluid with really high density, it's much harder to move through the fluid than if you have a fluid with really low density. It's much harder to move through liquid water than it is through just regular air, which liquid water has a density about 10 times higher than just normal air. And if you look at a typical vertical profile of density, the density tends to decrease exponentially with height. So right near ground level, night rear right near ground level, the density is much higher than it is above ground level. And since the density is much higher near ground level, that means the force of friction, by your formulation of the shear stress parameter, higher values of density mean higher values of friction. So that means you're going to have more drag being experienced by the air down here and less drag being experienced by the air up here. And since you've got more drag near the surface, right close to the ground level, that means your flow pattern at the surface is going to be weaker. And if you look at what we have now, so the faded black air is what it would be if there were no friction, but since there is much more friction near ground level, that's going to weaken the flow pattern near ground level. So now you can see this results in some sort of vertical wind shear pattern. As we go up, the wind intensifies with altitude. And if you look at this from a vorticity standpoint, that is if you uh, take a look at, if you were to say apply the vorticity operator on this flow pattern, then you would get spinning motions occurring as a consequence of this wind shear. And these spinning motions are turbulent eddies or just uh, turbulent uh, flow patterns that arise from the fact that we have really strong friction near ground level. But that's gonna do it for this segment on turbulence. And in the next segment, we are going to talk a little bit more about the mathematical formulation that we introduced earlier. So with that, I will see you all in the next segment.